So I'd like to echo the sentiments and thank uh, the organizers for selecting this abstract. Um, it's my great privilege to, to present uh, the work of uh, BC Cancer Agency in, in an exciting uh, project, I hope you'll agree, um, in, in precision medicine or, or personalized oncogenomics. Um, just a little background uh, about the BC Cancer Agency. Um, the population of British Columbia is 4.5 million that live in an area about twice the size of California. Um, the, uh, we're in quite a unique setting in that we can offer um, a provincial uh, population-wide cancer control program, and this uh, reaches from prevention, screening, diagnosis, through treatment. The scope of the POG project, this personalized oncogenomics, is, is to bridge the gap, really, between genomics research and clinical practice at the center. Um, we aim to identify tumor-specific therapeutic targets um, uh, in, in cancer patients and in this POG phase one project uh, with, with late stage metastatic disease. Um, so the process is, is, is outlined um, in the flow diagram at the bottom, begins with of course a patient consult and, and consent process. We typically collect uh, tumor biopsies, uh, we'll also request an archival FFPE block um, and match peripheral blood for, um, for that patient. And then we construct PCR-free whole genome libraries of, of the tumor and uh, the peripheral blood normal. Uh, we'll also perform transcriptome sequencing uh, as, as trans-specific RNA-seq. We sequence on the Illumina HiSeq um, instruments. Uh, and then uh, once a week, we, we meet with the referring clinicians, uh, discuss the, the relevant findings, uh, and of course, submit a report for their attention with, with recommendations. Um, this is a very busy slide, and, and I, d I don't intend you to, um, to take uh, a lot from it, other than the fact that this is a, uh, it, it is complex, but it is also structured. Um, and the color coding indicates the, the sub-departments within our bioinformatics department that are analyzing this data. And I've highlighted just a few of the areas in which TCJ data is actively contributing towards this project. Uh, so these include the um, comparison to expression database, and I'll show you a few examples of that in case studies. Uh, the variant calling uh, algorithms, both from uh, transcriptome and from, um, and from the genome to help filter our, our calls for, for somatic mutations. Uh, and of course, all of this feed from samples, feed through this process to, to a final report. Um, this, the study has thus far en enrolled 83 patients. Uh, eight of these are, are pediatric cases. We've performed 69 biopsies to date, um, representing 28 tumor types, and the tumor types and the frequency of those tumor types are shown in the bar plot. Um, you can see there's a, there's a bias towards uh, a collection of, of breast cancer samples, uh, primarily down to the, um, uh, to the very active participation of, of, of breast cancer clinicians within, within the BCCA. Um, we generate over 90x coverage of the tumor genomes and almost 50x coverage of the archival and matched normal genomes, uh, and over 300 million reads on average for a, a transcriptome library. Uh, importantly, we've reported 50 cases and counting, um, and the average time thus far is 38 days from, from biopsy to the report. So, so here are some of just uh, four of the areas in which, in which POG has guided treatment decision making. Um, I won't have time to go over all, but uh, we'll give case studies for the top two. Um, so providing directed cytotoxic chemotherapy and of course the targeted therapeutic options where available. Uh, and the second one on the list is the complementing or, or even correcting uh, FDA approved clinical tests. Um, uh, we also can identify cases of, of change diagnosis or provide a diagnosis where previously the primary tumor was, was unknown. Um, so jumping to our first case study, this is um, we call POG3, it was a squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Uh, this gentleman arrived in, in 2007 having had a red rash uh, on his upper chest. Um, he'd actually been living with this rash for, for well over a year, maybe even two years. Um, and when he presented, was, uh, had bleeding ulcerations. Uh, it was diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and he began multiple lines of, of chemotherapy um, and radiotherapy, began in 2007 and persisted uh, through to about um, 2012, 
when a new node uh, near his right ear appeared, the, the preauricular node. Um, both this node and, and his chest mass were growing uh, throughout the course of 2012 to a degree where the, the, the ear node was, uh, was really preventing his hearing and causing extreme pain. Um, so in, in September 2012, uh, both the, the node and, and the chest lesion were biopsied for this study. Uh, the somatic mutation status of, of the tumors is illustrated um, in the Venn diagrams here. And strikingly, uh, not only are there, are there many somatic variants, uh, um, as one might expect from cancers that have, have been uh, developing and subjected to a num number of rounds of, of therapies, um, so, so they're in the, hi in the hi high thousands, but there was very little overlap between these two, between these two lesions. They, they looked at really very different cancers indeed, and no overlap when we looked at the small indels. Uh, likewise, when we look at the copy number profiles for, the, for these two tumors, the, the chest is shown in the circos plot in the outer ring uh, and the uh, preauricular node and the, and the inner ring. And you can see that there's, uh, there's really relatively little commonality between these uh, two tumors at the copy number level. If we just highlight uh, chromosome 16 and, and take a look at the copy number plot, again, the breakpoint regions um, are few and far between. There are areas of gain. Uh, 16Q that, that are not apparently gained in, in the chest lesion, uh, a loss including um, um, a homozygous loss on, on uh, chromosome 16. And so we could put this data together in the form of uh, pathway analyses, and so this is integrating now the genome and the transcriptome data. Um, uh, and in this is looking at the chest tumor again, and you can see that there are many rearrangements consistent with uh, DNA repair defects that were detected. Um, but importantly, and I highlight here both uh, loss of P10, both in copy number and decreased expression, uh, and concomitant increase in AKT expression uh, and a gain of copy number. Uh, and so this was suggestive of, of treatment options. Contrast that with the preauricular tumor. Um, you can see now that, that we have very elevated EGFR amplicon, so amplify, uh, both in expression and again copy number amplifications. Um, just, to, just to name a few. But these ones suggest, and I apologize for the screamers in the audience, the, these, these two um, uh, suggested uh, treatment options, of course, and so in the preauricular tumor, uh, the overexpression of EGFR suggested allotinib, uh, and the P10 homozygous loss and AKT gain uh, for the chest lesions suggested treatment with everolimus. The patient was treated um, initially with both, both agents, um, but uh, uh, exhibited quite a lot of um, toxic uh, effects, and so was taken off Everolimus in initially. The, the, um, the ear tumor responded incredibly well to allotinib uh, and decreased from ju just after biopsy, very angry and red inflamed area. Uh, and the clinicians tell me that this is really dramatic progress. The involution of the tumor uh, was really recovering after a, a three short weeks. Um, and, and uh, also, his hearing uh, recovered in that right in that right ear. Uh, the preauricular tumor did did um, progress sadly, and uh, a second biopsy was performed. And in this biopsy, the analysis showed even further extreme amplification uh, of EGFR. So now to, to 55 copies of the gene, and extreme uh, uh, gene expression level as indicated by the red line. This is now compared to all of the TCGA data. Um, and was the most extreme expressor that, um, that we've identified across the, the whole of those uh, TCJ you know, 8,000 plus samples. Um, turning to the second case study to finish, uh, this was a 68-year-old uh, Asian male, uh, lifelong never smoker, who was diagnosed with non-small cell lung uh, adenocarcinoma uh, in January of 2013. Um, he, he had a, the, the approved clinical test for, for EGFR and ALK uh, through, through um, break-apart fish probes, uh, and the, the, uh, these, were, these were negative uh, in the clinic. Um, subsequently, uh, re had, had multiple lines of radiation and chemotherapeutic uh, uh, therapy between March and July of 2013, but, but continued um, to, to progress with the disease. And so in August, we took the same node um, uh, out for, for biopsy. Um, 
almost immediately the, the data the data yelled um, the the transcriptome fusion uh, between EML4 exons 1 to 13 and ALK exons 20 to 29, a really pretty canonical fusion for um, non-small cell lung cancer uh, patients. Um, and yet I just told you that, that the, the clinical test had been a negative with, with only 3% of the cells exhibiting break apart. Uh, closer inspection of the sequence both at the genomic level and, and the transcriptome level revealed that not only did the, um, the inversion that gives rise to this gene fusion exist, but a much larger inversion of chromosome 2 and subsequent insertion into the chromosome 12 locus um, had, had prevented one of the vices fish probes from binding adequately and hence the negative result in the clinical assay. Um, if we look at the expression level as a consequence of this oncogenic fusion, uh, we see that again it's, a, it's an extreme, this particular patient is an extreme expressor for, for ALK here on the right, 99th percentile of all expression compared to the TCJ, lung adenocarcinoma data set. Um, and ROS1, which is a, a second target for crizotinib, um, again was a high expressor in the 94th centile. Uh, and so this of course did suggest that, that crizotinib should be administered. Happily, the patient was just well enough to receive crizotinib within a day of the report being given to the, um, uh, to the clinician. Uh, and, and the tumor responded really dramatically. Um, with it, so, so within less than three months, uh, the tumors that you can see highlighted with the red arrows uh, had really began to, to shrink away and in fact were not visible for this, this lower lesion. Um, so to summarize the, uh, uh, the overall POG results for this, for this phase one study, um, uh, phase one of this study, uh, for each patient we've sequenced three or more genomes and a transcriptome. Um, 80, 83 concentered patients now actually with advanced cancer uh, have been enrolled, uh, 74 biopsies attempted, uh, some of them have failed giving us uh, 69 um, uh, biopsy materials. We have full data available for those 50 patients. Uh, and importantly, they've been clinically evaluated in 38 cases. And going back to the clinicians, the referring clinicians, and asking um, uh, can, can they ascribe actionable or, or treatable information from this genomic and transcript, transcriptome data, they report that in 87% of those cases, uh, there was um, action or treatment um, uh, possible. Uh, and it was offered in to 55% um, to of, of those 33 cases. Uh, of course, uh, a number of patients as in a late stage setting had died uh, during or shortly after the analysis. Um, what's next for, for the um, personalized oncogenomics? Well, we've, we've just had uh, approval for 5,000 cases and we intend to achieve um, these 5,000 cases within the next five years. This will take us from about one patient a week on average currently to, to greater than one patient per day in the coming years. Uh, we'll continue an emphasis on genome and transcriptome sequencing, but we will include um, uh, uh, a more elaborate onco panel um, for, for rapid turnaround time and a first look at these, uh, these tumors when they arrive. Um, we will br bring forward uh, from late stage disease to, to, to fresh diagnostic um, uh, biopsies. Um, and of course, increase, always aim to increase our speed and accuracy of the sequence analysis and the report generation. And, and importantly, we'll be verifying actionable results and continue to, to verify actionable results in a clinical lab prior to the treatment of the patient. And finally, it just leaves me to thank uh, the, the large multidisciplinary team at the BC Cancer Agency, uh, expertly led by, uh, on the clinical side, Janessa Laskin, uh, and on the research side, Marco Mara. So I'm very, very grateful to all the colleagues, and, and most in particular, the, the patients and their families and the BC Cancer Foundation for funding this project. Um, I have had to race through this a little, and so um, I'll be happy to, to see you at uh, poster number 10 if you have specific questions we can't address uh, in the time left here, but thank you for your attention. What, if any, are the plans to make these data public? So we, um, obviously, we, we, we need to be, we, 
very careful about the, the confidentiality of, um, of these individuals and we will um, uh, we certainly need to discuss this more in depth there's no immediate plans to, to, to release this data it just is a lost opportunity and we should try to figure out all this wonderful sequencing helping patients we need to uh, then use it to help all the patients and learn more. Absolutely. So, so um, of course, there are, there are publications. Um, uh, there's, there's one publication in, in press currently. Um, but, that, but, I mean, it's the mining. The, yes, the, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so one one question. Uh, very simple. So do you worry about the tumor heterogeneity when yeah. you analyze your data? Yes, we do. Um, and so, so one of the... Um, one of the aspects I, did, I didn't touch on is, is that we require tumor, tumor content of, um, uh, of, of over 40% before we will progress with all this deep genome and, and transcriptome sequencing. Uh, heterogeneity certainly um, plays a big part, and, and, uh, and in the analysis, we, we, um, we try and tease apart as much of that heterogeneity as possible. But a lot of it comes down to the, the sequence depth we're able to achieve um, with deep sequencing. So for the time of interest, let us move to the next speaker. So for um, TCGA, we face the same data, but uh, we use a different algorithm to interpret the data. This is particularly highlighted by mutation coding. So recently, the SEGC and TCG organized a dream challenge. So let us see the speak from um, Dr. Paul Boros from the OIRC, OICR, talk about uh, the summary from the first round SEGC-TCGA dream challenge about mutation coding. 